Well, I'm really happy to speak to you all this afternoon about endometriosis in adolescents. Uh, my name is Dr. Julie Hakim. I'm one of the pediatric gynecologists here at Texas Children's, and it's my privilege to speak to you today. So these are some of the topics briefly that I am going to discuss with you today and that I hope you take away from this brief discussion. Let's start with a definition of what endometriosis is. So endometriosis is really an inflammatory condition. Mainly it's due to the presence of endometrial-like tissue that doesn't egress with the normal menstrual cycle but can actually implant outside of the uterus and in specific locations inside the pelvis. And it can lead to specific clusters of symptoms that include things like really significant and painful period cramps, and this is called dysmenorrhea. And these can, this significant period cramps can occur before the actual menstrual cycle and actually persist throughout the menstrual cycle, throughout the month, and even despite treatment. So let's talk a little bit about how many girls might be affected by endometriosis. Um, depending on what literature source you read, there may be up to between 5 and 20% of adult women that have endometriosis. And many people actually don't realize that endometriosis can happen in adolescents. So amongst the adolescent girls that come to see us in clinic that have chronic pelvic pain um, or period cramps that don't get better either with analgesics or hormonal treatment, up to 75% of these girls will eventually be diagnosed with endometriosis. So just to let you know, this is a condition that does happen in adolescent girls as well as adult women. So let's talk a little bit about some of the likelihoods or things that would increase the likelihood that we might suspect endometriosis in your daughter. If she has a first degree relative that has endometriosis, like her sister or you, her mom, or somebody who's a first degree relative, that actually increases her likelihood quite significantly of having endometriosis as well. If um, she started her periods at a young age, so younger than age 11, if she's had pelvic pain or cramps that started right after her first period or just got progressively worse and worse over time, if she has short cycles, so that means she may have more than one cycle every month or a really short um, intermenstrual uh, period in between her menstrual cycles, or on the opposite case, if she has really heavy and prolonged bleeding, so she bleeds for more than months or more than a few days or weeks at a time. And specifically, there are certain abnormalities of the uterus or vagina, these are called obstructive ab abnormalities, that can dramatically increase a person's risk for endometriosis in the future. Let's talk a little bit more about some of the symptoms, some of which we've already touched upon so far. So really, endometriosis is um, characterized by pelvic pain that occurs prior to the menstrual cycle. It can occur all throughout the month. It can occur during the menstrual cycle and be most significant when the period is actually happening. There's also some pretty significant gastrointestinal um, side effects that can happen with the pelvic pain and cramping. These are things like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. There can also be pain to the low back associated with the menstrual cramping or even pain with passing a bowel movement or if um, your daughter or the patient is sexually active can involve pain with sexual activity. One of the most important things that we ask and that we look for is actually um, interruptions in lifestyle or in normal functioning of your adolescents. Um, so missing school, missing work, missing band, missing other types of activities due to cramping and pelvic pain. So sometimes in the United States, again, because providers may not be aware that endometriosis can affect adolescents, there can be a delay in diagnosis which again speaks to why having our pediatric gynecology clinic at Texas Children's is so important. We see endometriosis in young ladies all the time, so we're very attuned to this diagnosis and ready to help. So what you might expect from your first clinic visit or from a clinic visit where your daughter's experiencing a lot of pelvic pain and where we might suspect endometriosis, First of all, we're going to take a history of the pain, including the onset of the cramps, the onset of the timing, the duration, 
what treatments have been tried before, have they helped, have they not, um, what life um, impairments might there be because of this cramping, again, if there's a family history, or what other medical and surgical conditions your daughter might have. Um, I want to reassure folks that a pelvic exam is not necessarily needed at the first um, visit and especially won't delay our onset of treatment. So of course we do a complete exam when your daughter comes, but that doesn't not necessarily mean a pelvic exam or anything specifically that goes inside your daughter at the uh, first visit. Um, we may do um, blood or urine tests to kind of rule out other diagnoses that may give cramping or may give pelvic pain that we want to rule out. We also may perform a pelvic ultrasound, though this doesn't necessarily happen at the first visit either, only if treatment options at the lowest levels might fail your daughter and she's still having pelvic pain despite those treatments. And I'll talk a little bit more further on in this um, discussion about why we might advocate for surgery and when surgery would be offered. But truly, the definitive diagnosis of endometriosis can only be made with pelvic biopsies, so that involves surg surgery. So let's talk a little bit about some of the treatment options for endometriosis. And some of these we've talked about. So first off, we have analgesics and lifestyle modifications. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about each one of these. I just want to give the broad overview. Um, if these don't work or if these fail and your daughter is still having pelvic pain, we may advocate for hormonal therapy. So this can include with compounds that also involve estrogen and progesterone together. These can include, you know, the sort of average birth control pills that you may be more familiar with, a patch or a vaginal ring. We may also um, offer hormonal therapy for specific patients that only contain progesterone. These can include pills, an injection, an implant into the arm, or even an implant into the uterus called an IUD. And then there's some other treatment options, including GnRH agonists or antagonists. These are medications that really will influence the hormones that are produced by the ovaries in order to affect and uh, regulate the menstrual cycle even further, and then the surgical options like we talked about. So we really advocate a sort of rungs of the ladder approach to um, medical management for pelvic pain. So we try with the lowest possible rung of the ladder and see if that will control your daughter's symptoms and then work our way up if, if that doesn't work. So first, we. Um, advocate for adequate pain control, and I'll discuss a little bit more what that means. Um, our, real, our goal here is to get your daughter to return to her normal functioning state, going to school, going to her normal activities. Then again, we might advocate for hormonal therapy. Again, we're trying to either reduce or even eliminate the menstrual cycles um, in order to prevent seeding of those implants into the pelvis. And then we may actually advocate for hormonal suppression altogether so that we can completely eliminate the menstrual cycle and completely even shut down the ovaries altogether. So let's talk about the first or lowest rung of the ladder. So that really involves pain management. And one of the best pain control um, options that we have are really called, are called NSAIDs. These are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. You may be familiar with them. They're otherwise uh, some of the options are ibuprofen, naproxen, or others. So these can be started even without a definitive diagnosis of endometriosis, and these are really the first-line treatment for any girl that comes with pelvic pain or menstrual cramps. Ibuprofen or any of the other NSAIDs are best taken in the one to two days before the actual onset of the menstrual cycle. That 24-hour period before bleeding starts is the best time to get pain control on board. It will definitely help reduce the amount of cramping during the course of the menstrual cycle. And NSAIDs tend to work best if they're alternated with acetaminophen or Tylenol. So Tylenol is not great for helping cramping in and of itself, but when it's combined or alternated with ibuprofen or NSAIDs, these are actually synergistic compounds, so they both actually work better together. Um, the other thing I want to impress is that to be careful about underdosing. Um, one of our sort of upper levels of prescription for ibuprofen is up to 800 milligrams three times a day. So 
Um, for families who may just be wary of giving even one regular strength ibuprofen, and that's just 200 milligrams, you can see that you could very easily be underdosing the amount that is actually needed to control um, really significant cramping with a, a menstrual cycle. So now let's talk a little bit about more about hormonal therapy. So again, these are the combined hormones with estrogen and progesterone together. So again, these can include the birth control pills, the patch, or even a vaginal ring. So these are usually added on top of the analgesic approach um, if the analgesics alone aren't controlling the cramping. And hormones are safe in young adolescents. There are certain girls that are not candidates for um, hormones, and we would certainly discuss that thoroughly in clinic. But by and large, hormones are safe and they have certain side effects that need to be discussed. Um, but overall, we would recommend them for girls that are having significant alterations in their lifestyle due to cramping and analgesics aren't alone aren't working. These will again help alleviate pain, um, suppress disease progression, and we can um, provide them so that your daughter may have a monthly cycle, or if that's not working, we can actually prolong them so that your daughter only has a cycle every three months. So progestin-only options or progesterone-only options, um, these can include pills, injections, the implant, like I mentioned, or even the IUD. So again, these are specifically for girls who are not candidates for estrogen. Um, they have a similar functionality in that they will create a low estrogen environment in the body so that the endometriosis implants aren't progressed. Um, they do have some specific side effects that again need to be discussed in clinic, like irregular bleeding. And the long-term options that are progesterone only, these include the implant or even the IUD. These are kind of, in quotation marks, attractive options because they provide forgettable therapy in the sense that once we place them, it's not something that a family has to remember every day. Your daughter doesn't have to remember to take something every day or put a patch on. You can have these implants and then leave them there for up to three or even five years of effective therapy. So a bit more about the indications for surgery. So if analgesics aren't working, hormonal therapy isn't working, so these are kind of the first line approaches to medical management for um, endometriosis, and if these aren't providing adequate relief, we would then offer or advocate for a surgical intervention. Um, certainly if there's significant impairment, um, you know, missing multiple days of school every, every month, um, and if there's any indication on imaging that there may be an endometrioma. So that's an endometriosis implant that can occur inside the ovary. Um, that is pretty rare in adolescence, but it would be an indication for us to offer surgical management. And why surgery again is needed. It's very important that we um, visualize the appearance of the endometriotic implants in the pelvis. This can be a little bit challenging in adolescents. They tend to look different than in adults. But most importantly, that we take a biopsy of these implants so that we can have a truly definitive diagnosis of what we're treating. I want to also have you keep in mind that pelvic pain and cramping that occurs outside of the menstrual cycle can actually occur for a number of other reasons. And I've just listed a few here, but it's good that, to keep an open mind. And certainly we will ask some of these questions to eliminate some of these other diagnoses when we see your daughter in clinic. These can include things like irritable bowel syndrome, even lactose intolerance or other allergies to food, issues with the bladder, including interstitial cystitis, or even issues like anxiety, depression, or major stressors at home. So in terms of management of chronic pain, we've certainly talked about medical therapy and even some surgical therapies, but chronic pain is also and truthfully best managed with a, um, a holistic approach in terms of other options and other therapeutic modalities. So stress and managing chronic pain can definitely be um, improved with things like yoga, massage, and biofeedback. Acupuncture as well has been shown to help. Certainly we've advocated for prescription medications, including analgesics and other pain modulators, and even other things such as TENS, which is, stands for transcutaneous electrostimulation, which can help to reduce some of the signals from the pain nerve fibers to the brain. And this is not as painful as it sounds, even though it's a very long word, um, but all of these modalities together can help manage um, young ladies' pain. 
So just going over this one more time. So we advocate avoiding narcotics if at all possible and truly a multidisciplinary approach is best. Some of the lifestyle modifications we've talked about, including yoga and definitely exercise helps in managing chronic pain. Making sure the amount of sleep and not only the amount, but the quality of sleep your adolescent is getting will very much help reduce inflammation. Um, making sure the diet is robust and some of the um, um, other uh, factors that can be included in the diet include things like vitamin C supplements, going on a gluten-free diet, um, ginger, zinc, fish oil, and even some of the multivitamins will help. Stress management, heat therapy definitely helps as well. Pelvic floor physiotherapy is an option as well for some young ladies who have significant amounts of pain. Naturopathic therapy, as we've just mentioned, analgesics, as has been discussed, and the pain modulators that we've talked about. Some of these can include SSRIs. These are not only for managing mental health issues, but can also really help in modulating um, chronic pain, the hormonal treatments that we've talked about, and then more specific uh, surgical options. So just to kind of wrap up and summarize what we've talked about here today. So endometriosis is a common and chronic gynecologic disorder that can be manifested with um, pelvic pain that occurs throughout the month and outside of the actual menstrual cycle. Um, the diagnosis is mainly based on symptoms but is confirmed with a surgical biopsy of the implants. It absolutely can be present in adolescents. There are medical therapies including pain control, hormonal therapy, and suppressive therapies that may help um, reducing some of the symptoms of endometriosis. We would offer surgical management for refractory pain. And we definitely advocate chronic pain management through multimodal therapy as the most effective. So we're happy to see your daughter, yourself, or anybody in your family with any questions or issues regarding chronic pelvic pain, cramping at Texas Children's, and we're very comfortable with this diagnosis and here to help in any way we can. Thank you so much.